This video is sponsored by Tokyo Tree. Hello, hello, and welcome to another video. I have to say that I'm actually pretty excited to record this one because for once I kind of have an idea of what I want to talk about. Kind of gonna have a mini Q&A after talking about this piece here because I asked on Instagram for people to give me topics to talk about in these videos, but really people just ask like straight up questions instead of suggesting topics that I could um, spend a lot of time talking about. And so I decided uh, to just whatever, pick and choose whichever ones and just answer them however best I can instead of, I guess, focusing on a like a singular topic. But to start things off, this here that I'm working on is actually a giveaway prize for a very, very long ago thing that I did. I, I hosted a design contest where people can design a frog themed outfit and I picked around three winners and I was supposed to draw all three of, of their frog outfits that they designed. And so if you've seen my other frog related videos, this is going to be the last one because it took me like almost six months to finish all these drawings. Um, they were definitely not high up on the priority, but I'm glad that I finally finished them. And I gotta say, this might be my favorite one. So this design was actually the first prize winner. They also received a XP pen tablet from me, the Artist 10, I, if I remember correctly. And the reference picture that you see there on the right side is actually drawn by them and it looks amazing. They actually designed two characters, but I only picked the one with flowers in the hair as the actual winner. The designer is Honey Doodles on Twitter. There's some underscores in there. It will be on the screen. So if you like what you see, please go check them out because they are a pretty amazing designer and artist. So what drew me to this design actually is the pants. Like the pants are pretty amazing and the hair is also like it it's just so cute that, that there's flowers in it. And the pants has like patches and you guys know how much of a sucker I am for like sewn in patches. and. They added this accessory of the frog coin purse that is like the cutest thing. And um, a lot of people actually included lily pad umbrellas. And I wanted to also include it in the drawing that I was doing for them. As you can see, I am struggling with it. I struggled with the lily pad so many times because it's actually like, it might be my first time drawing a lily pad. I don't think I've ever really drawn a lily pad ever in my life the angle of it was like kind of uh tripping me out and and i'm not typically a person who uses like perfect geometric shapes in my art i i do it very messy and loose and and this is like kind of something that needs to be perfect in order for it to look like it makes sense wait brain fart actually just remember that it is not my first time drawing a lily pad because in my other frog video there was lily pads in the skirt design. So this is not my first time drawing a lily pad, but it is my first time drawing a lily pad umbrella. And now I don't remember what I was talking about. Cool, awesome. I also wanted to mention that I don't think I used a reference for this pose. I think I was thinking just like, I want them to be holding the umbrella and I'm just gonna go off of that. It's just one of those sketches that really worked out very well from beginning to end. There wasn't a lot of redoing for the body at least, but uh, I'm kind of sad that I had to cover up the legs because the pants are like pretty loose and big. And so I, I had to cover up the legs that I was actually pretty proud of. And I'm really glad that the sketching phase of this was actually pretty short. A lot of times I'm actually not a huge fan of the sketching phase. I'm uh. I'm a much more of a coloring and rendering type of person. Yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about the sketching phase. I will talk about it more during the sketching and lining phase. So I'm just going to head on over to Instagram and answer some questions. Oh, this is a really good one, actually. I think this person just submitted this, but Milky Chai on Instagram asks, 
I was wondering if you ever have trouble drawing on camera and that is a really really great topic. So lately I actually have been kind of struggling with having almost stage fright when I know that, that I'm recording because my brain is thinking okay I'm recording and because you can see my hands um, I, I have a lot of habits that I do when I'm drawing that kind of disrupt like the viewing experience and I become very self-conscious of them and I'm just like okay I should try to stop doing that so much even though it can be edited out I just you know I don't know like my brain just does that thing so like for example I do this thing where I zoom in and out like very rapidly a lot of times or I move my canvas by like one centimeter and it's like a very unnecessary thing to do but I just do it out of out of habit and as a viewer and I would know this too because I, I watch back my my recordings a lot it's very like hectic and kind of um what's the word jarring to see someone just like manhandle the canvas like for no reason I'm just like annoyed at myself almost for being like I'm like why are you moving the canvas so much and so when I record I, I get conscious of that and sometimes it's do it does kind of like disrupt my creative process in a way but it's not such a big deal another thing that I do is also something that's pretty common for a lot of artists I think I think it's almost like impossible for people not to do this is to pause and just look at your art and examine it observe it I do that like I do I draw an eye and then um you'll see like my hand kind of pause or go out of um, camera and I'm kind of just like staring for for like three or four seconds and I do that a lot and um my sister is my editor and she tells me she's like why do you have so many moments where you're just not doing anything and I'm like I'm sorry I'm examining my art like what do you want me to do I can't just draw like a robot endlessly and forever non-stop like I can't do that you can't do that no one can do that except maybe if you're a superhuman I don't know it's just still like tiny things that I notice about myself now while I draw that I get really conscious of when I'm recording and I also just feel like um I kind of have to make less mistakes. Why do you say it like that? Mistakes? Mistakes? Because I am recording. If I draw a face that I don't like, I can't, I'm kind of thinking like, dang it, now I have to erase this and redraw it on camera and people are going to see that I, like, I do this a lot and that I redo a lot. And I know it's a human thing and people actually want to see that because they want to see the full process. They want to get all the juicy details of what went on during the process what were um what did i delete what am i hiding like kind of like that but as a content creator it's very difficult to get out of that mindset to keep everything perfect um for like viewing and so that's kind of just difficult about drawing on camera so first question out of the way i actually real quick want to talk about this video's sponsor which is sakurako which I am very, very excited about because it's about snacks. Tokyo Treat and Sakuroko are sister companies who both do Japanese snack subscriptions every month. They sent me both boxes for March and I was really excited to try everything out, not gonna lie. So first opening Tokyo Treat, this one focuses more on exclusive or limited edition stuff that comes from Japan. Think like seasonally flavored snacks like Pepsi or Kit Kats. March's theme was Japan's best bites. So it comes with the best treats from each season, winter, summer, spring, and fall. The box also comes with a really handy booklet that tells you more information about the culture of Japan, the snacks, and of course, allergy warnings. I think the thing I was most excited about was the Kit Kats because my sister loves melon flavored stuff. Here's a preview of everything before I opened them, but I actually didn't taste everything. There were some things like the gum and the ring pop that I wanted to taste when I wasn't recording. So starting off with the Kit Kats, these are cantaloupe melon instead of honeydew melon. Personally, I really, really like them, although my sister is more of a honeydew melon type of person. Next up are these mini chocolate covered marshmallows that ended up being my sister's favorites and these apple gummies that ended up being one of my favorites. Another one that I liked a lot were these seaweed chips. I think they're actually a mixture of Korea and Japan. 
they are potato chips with nori on them and it tasted so good i was such a sucker for these i think i finished them like the same day another favorite was the blueberry pocky i'm not usually a huge blueberry person but i really really like these and they had me buying a bunch of pocky afterwards because i started craving them and a really cute thing about them was that the sticks were actually heart-shaped some other honorable mentions is the curry snack that had a very, very strong curry flavor. The corn puffs that reminded me of how Filipino sweet corn tastes like. And there was also this sour plum candy that I liked. And despite not being an orange juice type of person, I actually ended up enjoying the orange drink. Now moving on to Sakurako, this month's theme is Taste of Japan, which has authentic and regional treats. So they have things like mochi, tea, and even tableware. All these snacks already look so different from Tokyo Treats box. A lot of them are actually pastries and wafers. There's a tea and lollipop and even a chestnut pudding. But the thing I was most curious about was this tableware that is actually a kanji side dish. I wasn't expecting there to be something like this in this box and I'm really happy with it because I can already think of all the things that I can do with it. So some favorites, I really like the mochi made with soybean flour and I love loved the vanilla wafer thing. I like just consumed all of it very quickly. <laughs> but I think my number one favorite thing was the cafe cream cakes which had some kind of banana filling. I really loved this a lot. I'm really, really happy I got to try out these boxes. And if you want your own, you can use my code for $5 off your first purchase. And you can get some pretty great Japanese snacks. So I am back now and I am lining. And you guys know I have a very, very complicated relationship with lining and it's a love-hate relationship. But, but this time lining her face was actually pretty relaxing. At least I remember it being like it just came together so nicely from the sketch and I just really love how the lines on her face turned out now as for the rest of the body aside from the hair I was kind of struggling like uh, of course with the umbrella lily pad umbrella I struggled a lot again and then with the hands too I struggled and surprisingly I kind of struggled with the pants too so I'm going to answer more questions here. Something that was related to kind of how I was talking about line art. Uh, Suna Yuki on Instagram asked about things that I dislike drawing. And in general, I dislike drawing hands just like everyone else. And I also really hate drawing glasses. Probably because I suck at drawing them and I've never really tried to improve, which is probably why I still hate drawing them and I, I still suck at drawing them. but. That's a couple of things I don't like drawing. I used to really hate drawing noses because I always felt like it threw the entire face off, but I've grown to really love drawing noses to be honest because I got better at them. And the way that I got better at them is examining how other artists draw noses, examining how noses look in real life and you know, like why they look like that, how different noses look and also ears. I used to hate drawing ears, but now I, I don't because I got better. And as you can see, there's like a trend here where I normally dislike drawing things that I, I'm not good at drawing. And I guess if you have some stuff that you don't like to draw, get better at doing it so that you actually like kind of enjoy it. Or maybe you, you will hate it even more because now you're like forcing yourself to draw it even more. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this, but moving on. Lil Short Gobstopper asked, um, how did I learn to shade and render my pieces? And this is similar to what I said about noses. It's really just about examining how other artists do it and examining real life objects and learning from what you are looking at. You don't even necessarily have to draw to get a better understanding of it. Like you can look at your own face in the mirror and see where shadow falls and you'll be able to apply that to your shading and your rendering. You can turn on a light source and see how that changes the shadows on your face too. 
Now with rendering, rendering is a bit advanced because um, there's a lot of ways that people interpret rendering, I guess. Like to some people, rendering is shading and to other people, rendering is painting, over painting, just bringing the piece together and blending. But however you view it, you will learn from practice. And I know we all hate hearing that, you know, like practice makes perfect. And to be honest, um, that's like kind of a controversial saying because you can do something as long as you can and practice it as much as you can. And maybe you won't get better. Who knows? Like if you don't, if you don't apply yourself or maybe it just doesn't vibe with you, you might not get better. One of my classes actually talked about this, about the, I think 10,000 hour rule where some people had believed back then that you can practice something for 10,000 hours and become an expert at it. But we were discussing how that just isn't true. And that discussion has kind of helped me understand why I now dislike the phrase practice makes perfect because it doesn't. You cannot get better at something with practice alone. You need to apply yourself and learn from what you are actually practicing. So like I said before, if you want to get better at shading and rendering, you first need to understand it. You need to study it. And studying doesn't necessarily have to be this grueling thing that is a chore and stuff. It can be fun if you make it fun. Personally, I do it by examining faces, examining objects. I don't even have to draw to do that and I will get a better understanding of how things look and then I can practice by applying it to my art. So observation and practice go hand in hand together. You need to learn and practice, not just practice. And you also need to practice, not just learn, because obviously if you're just learning and you're not doing, then you'll never know if you'll actually get better. And if you're just practicing and not learning, there's a large chance that you won't improve. And I apologize if none of that made sense. I'm not very good at explaining things. But um, I get a lot of questions about rendering and shadow placements. And really, I will just keep repeating the same answer. And it's just to observe, you know, study some photographs, some references, and really try to learn from them because you can do all these things but if you don't apply yourself and actively try to learn from what you're doing then you're, you're just not going to get better so moving on to another question you.fishu suggested a topic about integrating interests with your art and i i like this because i'm trying to do that i'm attempting to do it with historical romance I've talked about it plenty of times, like period romance, um, you know, whatever romance. Um, I'm trying to draw more of that. So I'm trying to learn how to draw Victorian era dresses, Regency dresses. And I know you guys probably haven't seen that on my YouTube, but I am working on it. It's pretty fun. I mean, it's also a bit frustrating because it's not exactly turning out the way I want it to. You know, there's there's an attempt and I'm pretty proud that I'm trying. <clears throat> in terms of interest, I've always been interested in TV shows too. And, and if you listen to my recent podcast, the one about Percy Jackson actually mentioned my little sketchbook project that I've been doing where I just have a digital sketchbook and I'm planning to print that out. And that's also a way of merging my interests into my art because I have really gotten into bookbinding lately and that like arose from being into historical romance and I wanted to bookbind some historical romance books and now I am applying it to my art by planning on printing the sketchbook pages out and then turning it into a booklet. And with that, within the actual pages and sketches, I've been sketching a lot of the characters from TV shows that I watch. I sketch um, some David Rose from Schitt's Creek and also I drew Anne Bonny from Black Sails. So that was really fun too. And it's just small things like that, like including a, a little bit of your interest into your art that could make it just a tad bit more fun and interesting for you 
and it could possibly motivate you to draw a lot. And wow, that's a pretty good segue into some other questions asking about how to get motivation to draw. Wow, I was kind of I was kind of smooth with that, honestly, I guess I have to admit. So a lot of people ask how, how do you motivate yourself? How do you motivate yourself to draw? How do, I make, how do you motivate yourself to do anything? And it's just about finding some fun into what you are doing. Motivation is about having a reason to be excited about doing the thing you want to do, whether it's drawing, reading, whatever. And it's just about finding that excitement for it. Maybe you can assess like, why don't I want to do it? Why don't I have any motivation to do it? Like, for example, I'm just going to use exercise as an example because I've been trying to exercise more, but I haven't been motivated to do it. And the main thing why I, I'm not motivated to exercise is because I hate like being out of breath. I hate being sweaty also. And the thing that kind of counteracts that is, um, finding methods of exercise that is fun because then I, I'm, I get excited about actually doing it. And so I started playing Just Dance. You know, that's a really out of breath, sweaty type of activity, but I actually get excited about doing it. And so I actually do it. It's just like things like that. And then you take that and then you apply it to art. And it's like, why don't you want to draw art? Oh, it's because you're struggling with drawing faces. Okay, what if you take a break from drawing faces and you draw something else that you want to try or you draw something else that you actually like or you draw some fan art for a show that you are really excited about and that turns that excitement into your art too. Another way that I get motivated is to just see other people's like art. If I see some amazing art on my feed, I'm like, dang, like I want to do something like that. And then I go and try and I get motivated that way. That's kind of like a slippery slope though, because some people get discouraged when they see other people's really good art. And you know, if you're one of those people, then you know yourself better than I do. So I guess don't look at other people's art if you're feeling unmotivated. I don't know. But with that, I'm going to take a quick break and I will be back in a couple minutes. All right, hello everyone. I am back after consuming an unhealthy amount of cream cheese wontons. I've honestly been really like addicted to these things. I've been cooking them for like the past three days. It's really bad. <laughs> I really should stop. So I relished tonight and because it'll be my last night eating some cream cheese wontons in a while. Anyway, before I get wrapped up in a tangent about literal cream cheese wontons, I'm gonna answer more questions. So Lem X and Squeak asked, did anyone tell you to not do art and find something better? It's kind of upsetting and yes, I agree with you. It is very upsetting whenever that happens. And if you if you've listened to my first podcast episode, the one where I'm drawing Isabella, you've heard some of my school stories and you've heard that I had beef with my math teacher. Well, not really beef, but basically my math teacher was trying to convince me to go into art and or to go into math, sorry, instead of art. And it was really aggravating because he knew how much like he knew how passionate I was about art. Yet he still tried to convince me to get out of it because of money. I, it's just so like like ugh to think about, you know? Like I know that the artistic route probably isn't the best route to go if you are looking to have a financial stability, but it was it's what I'm good at and it's what I love to do. And he just tried to like convince me otherwise because I somehow am also good at math. He was my he was my um, he was my algebra teacher, my pre-algebra teacher, and then my calculus teacher. So I had him for three years in high school. And as much as I love him as a math teacher, 
this was just one of our like things that we would do where like he would randomly just go up to me or ask me because I also had him for a summer school to, to prepare for calculus um, where he would ask me what I, I plan to do after I graduate and every single time I would tell him um, I'm gonna go into art and you can't convince me otherwise and kind of like the rest of the class would just like listen in and be like oh he's bothering her again and it, it was just really annoying and it was kind of fun banter sometimes but in reality it really bothered me and I just wish that he would he would have stopped doing it. I'm lucky enough to only receive that kind of treatment from him because my other high school teachers and I don't know why I'm talking about high school but um, I guess because going into college I'm already majoring in art and I'm, I'm rarely ever gonna get a professor that is gonna discourage me from doing art because they're like art professors but anyway my other teachers in high school were very supportive of my art uh, one of them even sent me a note in college like saying that she was rooting for me and my my um, pursuing of art if that makes sense but but I guess yeah it's only been my high school math teacher that told me not to do art okay more questions more questions uh, Tara Goss asked are, do you have any OC creation tips and tricks? My, uh, what's my creative process and how do I design? So I can't even remember how many times I have recommended this video, but go watch Night Zhang's video about costume design. And even though it's about costume design, a lot of what you learn in it, you can apply to straight up character design. There's also a bunch of videos on character design that will probably help you Personally, I haven't really watched them. I've only watched this one video and it was enough to like really get me, get my, my juices flowing, you know. But basically, what I learned from that video is create a mood board. Don't neglect the mood board. Um, the same way that animators use storyboards, designers use mood boards to keep track of what they want their ideas and their brainstorms and their inspirations and the references. Make a mood board. Don't neglect it. Just do it. Now gathering resources for a mood board, I use Pinterest. And if you don't want to use Pinterest, you could always browse um, Instagram, Twitter, Google, like look up ideas or fashion and stuff like that. You can get inspiration from other people's design, but be careful with that. Don't take too much of other people's designs. But basically, you have your idea, okay? Let's assume that you have an idea and then you go on Pinterest and you start exploring that idea. So right now I am actually in the works designing a chubbier character. So I am going to look up some references on Pinterest on how to draw chubbier body types. I'm going to look up references of plus size people and at non skinny references. I'm going to look up that and I'm going to include it in my mood board. Then for fashion, I have colorful ideas. You know, that's like my main baseline for my character designs is that they have to be colorful. It's my one requirement. And I also for sure want her to have Kind of like a knitted sweater so i go on pinterest i look up knitted sweater designs you know some fashion or whatever for color schemes you can look and scour other people's ocs to get inspiration from their color schemes save that for the aesthetic save some clothes for fashion references save anything that gives you inspiration for the design and really that's the main thing is that you're looking for inspiration. Very rarely do designers ever just design something from scratch without looking at other things for inspiration and ideas. Okay, like not not everyone is a genius like that. So take advantage of your resources and look for references, look for ideas and all that. Once you've assembled the mood board, have it with you while you are drawing you know keep it in a tab while you're sketching keep it in, a, in another window next to your drawing or whatever like that and use it use it copy some stuff from it 
brainstorm and see what works. Mix, mix, match, mix, match, mix and match some ideas from it. Mess up, uh, mess, mess around with the different combinations that you can do, because that is what we call concept art. You're, you know, exploring the different concepts that you can make and you can do with this character, and you are trying to figure out which one that you like best, which one works, and just experiment. And then basically, once you land on a certain concept that you really like, then you just draw it, and it's just drawing process from then on. I want to do a video on this eventually. My next one I'm hoping is actually going to be in-depth me designing the character that I just talked about. So hopefully I can um, talk more about that in a future video. So hey Ray314 asked um, or said I guess maybe you can talk about your favorite characters, shows, movies, slash books and I could talk about this for a really long time. So, in terms of characters, um, I can't think of favorite characters at the top of my head. I guess right now I can think of Nico Robin from One Piece. I just like her vibe and I love how she looks. Free time skip. That's very important. <laughs> I like her pre time skip design. And um, I guess I'm like drawn to the quieter characters or like the cool characters rather than the cute ones. That's just that's just the type of, you know, character liker <laughs> that I am. But my favorite shows, um, even though it's trashy TV, I really like Vampire Diaries. Like I haven't even finished it though. Well, actually, let me correct that. I started with Vampire Diaries and I I ended with um oh gosh <laughs> my favorite show and one of my favorite shows I already forgot the title. What's it called? The Immortals. No, the originals. The originals. Um I started Vampire Diaries, I got to season three, and then I switched to the originals. I finished the originals. I tried to go back to Vampire Diaries, and I think I got to like season five whenever the sirens show up or whatever and I got bored because like the originals are what made the show interesting and um I just get so annoyed with Elena I hate her not gonna lie I, I, and I hate love triangles so the entire show is a love triangle or at least like half of it so I can't with it oh gosh am I even answering this question correctly they asked about my favorite shows and, the, and now I'm just trashing on Vampire Diaries. But I guess um, the originals is one of my favorite shows that I've watched. Um, that definitely doesn't say anything about the quality of it and if it's good or not. I just really liked it because I like the characters. It's definitely not the best TV show. Okay, let's just say that. I would say Bridgerton, but I'm not like, um, I don't know. <laughs> How do I explain? How do I explain it? Um, let's just say. I liked the first season enough to read the book series and that's what got me into reading historical romance. And then uh, I enjoyed half of the second season. I know a lot of people really enjoy the second season, but as a book reader, the first half of it was really good and then it just turned into just a, you know, a clown show. So uh, I don't like the last half of season two. And season one, personally, I find really, um, after re-watching it a few times, I find Simon and Daphne incredibly annoying. I don't like them that much. Now that I remember, I haven't even finished their book. I listened to the audiobook of Bridgerton because I wanted to listen to the first book before watching the first season. I kind of got impatient, so I, I got to the part where they got married and then I stopped because I was like, okay, I don't really like to read about married life. So I'm just going to watch the season one, season one already. So I enjoyed that. And then um, basically after they got married, I was like, well, like, I don't know what's going to happen anymore. And then I never went back to read the first book, The Duke and I, because I just went ahead and read for, um, Anthony's book, The Viscount Who Loved Me, because I was like, okay, I'm invested in Anthony. He's literally Grahatia, like how can I not be invested in him? 
Uh, as for movies, I really like Pride and Prejudice. Anything with Keira Knightley in it, basically. Um, I was really into X-Men movies, actually. Um, I had like a phase when I was like 14 or 15. I discovered X-Men First Class and it became one of my favorite movies. And then I was like, oh, there's more? I need to see everything else. And so I watched like the old X-Men movies and I enjoyed them even though some of them are bad. But let's not talk about that. Anyway, I just enjoy things just to enjoy them, okay? Like I'm not a huge, huge critic about some stuff. I mean, I guess I can be a critic about historical romance because of the way I talked about Bridgerton. But with X-Men, it's cool. MCU, it's cool. Superheroes are cool. I don't think, you know, I'm not that type of person that is like, superheroes are lame and nerdy and blah blah blah. MCU is ruining cinema. I'm not, I'm not that type of person. I just enjoy it for what it is. I will say though that the MCU has been deteriorating lately and it's been getting difficult to enjoy because the CGI is bad. I can't ignore it. I can't ignore that. <laughs> I wouldn't exactly say that the MCU is my favorite though. Um, I've dabbled a little bit into DC. I watched the Snyder Cut and it was cool. Let's see, what else? I also had a phase where I was obsessing over Pirates of the Caribbean, except the fourth movie is trash. Um, anything that doesn't have Elizabeth Swan and Will Turner in it is trash, okay? Lord of the Rings is pretty cool. I recently rewatched that, the extended version with my boyfriend who loves, loves, loves Lord of the Rings and it still holds up. It's pretty amazing. And then we watched, um, <laughs> okay, this is gonna be, it's gonna get some people mad, but we watched Rings of Power. I was enjoying the first few episodes. And then um, as we got further into the season, we were like, wait, like this is kind of not like, this is not great. I don't know, it just didn't hit, <laughs> you know, like uh, could have been better. It's okay, I guess. I don't feel too strongly about it like other people do. Um, I enjoyed some of it and I didn't enjoy some of it. So I'm kind of just in the middle about it. So with books, gosh, I'm going all over the place now. With books, I really like historical romance. I feel like I talk about it way too much for being on an art channel, but uh, I've read Bridgerton. My first uh, series that I read was Bridgerton. And in Bridgerton, I ended up really liking A Gentleman's Offer and When He Was Wicked. Those two were my favorite books in that series. And then after that, I ended up consuming like almost every single book that Julia Quinn wrote. Uh, I dipped into the Smythe Smith series, which is in like the same universe and timeline as the Bridgerton series. And I liked all those books. My favorite one is Sum of All Kisses but I'd never read the fourth book because I heard it was bad. Then after I read all of Julia, Julia's work, um, I moved on to Lisa Claypez. Claypez? Claypez. And I started with a Wallflower series because I, I just look, looked up what was the most popular. And that was, um, that was good. It was all right. Everyone loves the devil in winter. And then I moved on to the Hathaways and the Hathaways some of those books I don't necessarily like, but the last book in that series, like, almost shattered me. It, I, I discovered that I'm a real sucker for um, pen pal trope, where people like writing letters to each other or whatever, and I just like, I was on the hunt for like books like that. And so I discovered um, Sophie Laporte, or Laporte, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. It's a very underrated author, kind of new in the historical romance genre, but after I read all of Lisa Claypez's work, I moved on to her. Sophie Laporte's work is what you would call clean. Like, there's no dirty scenes, there's no explicit scenes in there. And I just enjoy her writing style so much. There's this one book called um, Lady Ludmilla's Accidental Letter that got me hooked on her. But yeah, I guess talking about what I'm interested in actually worked in terms of getting me to talk because we are at the end of the video now. 
and I actually forgot to talk more about the thing that I was drawing, so sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, but yeah, I'm gonna end this video and hope you look forward to the next one. So see you there. Goodbye.